Okay, uh, welcome everyone. So good to see you all um, to our roundtable on academic freedom in the Middle East. Um, let me just uh, quickly introduce our moderator and discussant, um, Dr. Miriam Lowy. Uh, she's professor in the Department of Political Science at the College of New Jersey. Um, and um, Miriam, thanks so much again for, for uh, being with us and doing this and you have the floor. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you so much for organizing this. And I'm so happy that uh, we could um, meet and conduct this panel. Um, my name is Miriam Lowy, and um, I chair the Middle East North Africa wing of MESA's Committee on Academic Freedom. I've lost the screen for some reason. Um, anyway. Um, uh, I chair the Middle East North Africa Wing of Mesa's Committee on Academic Freedom. And as you may know, our committee tracks cases of violations of academic freedom or threats to ac academic freedom in the region and writes letters of protest to members of government, university administrators and the like. And, 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 and so that's why I'm here chairing a panel discussion on displaced scholars and academic freedom um, uh, in the Middle East and uh, North, North America now. Uh, and our panelists today are all scholars with the Global Academy. Um, and the Global Academy, as you may know, is an initiative within MESA that uh, with a special focus on scholars who have had to leave their homes in the Middle East or North Africa, seeks to assist them in pursuing their scholarship and academic careers and sustain research collaborations and knowledge production between them and their counterparts outside the region and especially in North America. Um, our panelists today are themselves scholars who have had to leave their homes and their lives in Turkey and Syria, and now live in Canada and the United States. They are Nihat Celik, currently at San Diego State University, Utku Balaban at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Evren Altinkas at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada, and Basileus Zeno at York University in Toronto, Canada. Their contributions to this topic are both deeply personal and professional. Their scholarship and their lived experiences are intertwined and inseparable. Hence, what they contribute to this discussion on challenges to academic freedom indeed to the intensification of challenges and threats to academic freedom that we are witnessing in these fraught times in North America, Europe, and the Middle East and North Africa is especially pertinent. And so I feel especially honored to be here today with my colleagues to chair this panel discussion. This panel was scheduled to be held during the MESA annual meeting in Montreal last month, but for a variety of reasons, we had to postpone that discussion to a later date. And we're very pleased that you in the audience are joining us today for this important um, panel discussion. Um, before we begin, I want to point out that the papers that animate the discussion today are available for you to read in print in the August issue of IJMES, the International Journal of Middle East Studies, as a special roundtable on displaced scholars and academic freedom. In its printed form, the roundtable consists of five papers, and four of those will be discussed today. As a group, this is a very illuminating set of papers for they combine personal experiences, both in their home countries and in their new North American contexts 
with analyses of the intensification of authoritarianism in their home countries and with and with it the increasing challenges challenges to in fact the withering away of academic freedom as well as analyses of the types of challenges to academic freedom that these scholars witness and experience in their now North American homes. And they offer suggestions for their mitigation. Each of our panelists will speak for about five minutes. At the end of the four presentations, I will make some comments and ask a few questions. The panelists will then respond, and following that, we will open up the floor to questions from our audience. The first two papers um, explore different elements in the growth of authoritarianism in Turkey and the ways in which the government has intensified its control over the academy with its chilling effects on not only university autonomy, but on scholars' research agendas, and even more consequentially, their very careers and source of livelihood. We begin with Dr. Nihat Celik, whose paper is entitled The AKP Era, Higher Education, Strategies for Establishing Hegemony Over Turkish Universities. Please, Dr. Celik, the floor is yours. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, I would like to thank Mesa Global Academy and Mimi Kirk for organizing this event, and thank you again for you uh, for chairing this uh, event. Um, I will talk about the development of academic freedoms in Turkey, but first, in order to understand what's going on currently, uh, I will uh, give a brief description of my theoretical uh, framework. I used uh, Gramsci's uh, hegemony concept, and as you know, uh, universities are sites of knowledge production, and they are also sites of, uh, also they are areas of uh, struggles for uh, social control and uh, social hegemony. Uh, Turkey, after the establishment of the Republic in 1923, had only three universities until the uh, early 1950s. And in that period, uh, during the Second World War, there were some pressures on the scholars from the left and right because of the war, and they were expelled from the universities, but the numbers were very, very uh, small. So in 1946, with the new law, uh, for the first time, the faculty gained the right to uh, elect their university presidents uh, through their um, direct vote. But in 1971, uh, this, uh, this autonomy was curbed, uh, which was at a greater degree provided by the Constitution of 1961. And after the 1980 military coup, the uh, military administration established the Higher Education Council, even more curbing the uh, scientific and administrative autonomy of universities. And they also prohibited the election of university presidents, rather they were uh, appointed by the uh, president of the country. And in 1992, after criticisms, election method uh, was uh, revived again. And uh, the, the, with the Higher Education Council still enjoying a great deal of authority over the universities. So when the AKP was established, in 19 in 2001 in their party program which was published next year um, they promised to abolish the higher education council provide a uh, total scientific and administrative autonomy to the universities however after coming to power and consolidating their power they actually forgot these promises and instead tried to control the universities by uh, creating uh, new legislation. So this reached its, its highest level um, uh, after the uh, failed coup attempt in 2016 because of the state of emergency, which provided enormous powers to the government and uh, President Erdogan. 
so we saw unprecedented levels of attacks and terminations at universities. So the legislation may actually abolish uh, tenure protection, due process um, procedures in termination of scholars, and uh, many other uh, rights to the uh, president and the government. Uh, also, it abolished the election system at universities. That is why actually starting from 2016 on, uh, there was some uh, discontent about this method and it erupted after the uh, Boazchi University's uh, uh, pre presidential appointment, Melih uh, Bulu, uh, through uh, by the president without any uh, election. So it led to some uh, popular uh, reactions and uh, ongoing demonstrations at the uh, university. In the process, uh, if we include research assistants, PhD students, uh, roughly 25,000 people from the scholar community of Turkey uh, lost their jobs. And uh, in most cases, they also are placed under an employment ban and also a travel ban, so they cannot uh, look for uh, jobs abroad. So this situation is actually, the current situation is uh, akin to the situation after the military coup of 1980. Uh, you know, a political party which promised democracy, human rights in its formative years. Later, after consolidating power and evolving into a dominant party, a hegemonic party, uh, with the uh, transformation of Turkey into a presidential system and the rise of competitive authoritarianism, actually started to do just the same, whatever it criticized uh, in the past, in order to control the university. So the impact is that uh, it is about the student clubs, it's about the research projects, because presidents are appointed like party commissars to uh, those universities, and Boazic's reaction in that respect became uh, symbolic. Uh, so that is the situation at Turkish universities uh, at the moment, and there are many uh, thousands of displaced scholars, of course, not only from Turkey, we know people from Afghanistan, Ukraine, uh, Syria, Turkey, and other countries coming from some African countries where th there is conflict. Uh, and in that respect, professional organizations such as the Middle East Studies Association uh, uh, can have special bodies like the Global Academy to guide these scholars to uh, help them navigate the murky waters of a different uh, academic uh, and scholarly uh, system in another uh, country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Celik. Um, we will now hear from Dr. Utku Balaban, and his paper is entitled Industrialization and Academy in Contemporary Turkey. Please, thank Dr. You. Balaban, go ahead. Thank you, very much. Uh, thank you very much, Miriam. Thank you very much, Mimi. Thank you very much, Ms. Global uh, for giving us this opportunity. So um, I'll... Um, yeah, the, the paper the paper uh, was and is about the connection between industrialization, the late industrialization experience in Turkey and academic freedoms. Um, uh, the, the 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 main factor that just sort of motivated me, prompted me to just work on this kind of a project, on this kind of a commentary, was basically the, some sort of a gap, I believe in this growing literature about the weakening of the academic uh, freedoms uh, in Turkey in general and the uh, Middle East in, in, uh, in Turkey in particular and the Middle East in general. Uh, I'm glad that Miriam, you just gave the floor first, Nihat, who just uh, gave us a wonderful uh, recap of you know this, this very long history of operation uh, in the academia, uh, at least you know, for the last several decades, not even before. Uh, but you know, let's see. There, there is just one element I will say. You know, like uh, uh, that's it's how I felt like, when I uh, used to teach in Turkey, and that connection, uh, let's say, between let's say this uh, authoritarian tendencies of the uh, political parties who are in power, and you know, let's say, uh, of the military, and you know, they let's say, desire to just keep the academia in control. 
I mean, that equation sort of you know, has become a bit more complex with the uh, with the introduction of a new element, if you will, you know, to this equation. And that new element, I will say, is the industrial relations uh, themselves. So let me briefly show a couple of these slides, um, just you know, to clarify what I mean here. I will say, uh, so I, this is sort of not the, the title of my paper, but the title of my uh, presentation, and I'm going to hopefully explain why in the next you know, like, coming few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> so here is, you know, like they say, one of the, um, I think, clear illustrations that, you know, they say we see something new, I mean, in, in recent uh, one and a half decades or almost two decades. Uh, since the 1990s and before, basically, the, the, there was sort of a, a relationship, you know, rough, but you know, still, you know, like the visible relationship between research and development expenditure and academic and cultural freedoms in Turkey. Since the early 2000s, since the second half of the 2000s, basically, this uh, relationship, you know, like was just reversed. The R&D expenditure just, you know, continued to grow. Um, at a higher pace than in the at least you know, two previous decades, while they see the freedom of academic and cultural expression scores uh, measured by all this, uh, produced by uh, varieties of democracy, this uh, database, uh, basically just, you know, <clears throat> um, declined significantly. Uh, when we look at the long-term data, then now I need to replace this, say, this uh, indicator and the expenditure with manufacturing exports. Uh, because I mean, R and D expenditure data that doesn't just go back into the, to the previous decades. Um, so, like that, again, like this, we see sort of in this uh, connection, even after the 1980s, between the growth of manufactured exports and the academic uh, uh, free and cultural expression freedom scores. And again, so like we see this in reverse relationship. Now. Uh, so like, you know, I think you know, like, this is a curious, curious, this a connection because I mean, the more you, money you spend on this uh, uh, research and development, which is sort of the bread and butter of you know, like scientific research, uh, the weaker the academic freedoms are. So, and so like, what could the, just the reason be? This is a question we could just, I think, uh, ask or justify and justify that kind of question. And what we see here is that uh, in the same, same time period after, like, I mean, since the early uh, 2000s, basically we just see a significant okay. shift in terms of who spends on what. Uh, as you see in this part of the graph, you know, let's say the uh, share of the corporations and higher education institutions, all right, in the total are in the expenditure uh, is illustrated, uh, are illustrated. And, you know, there's sort of, you know, like, you know, a, uh, significantly say change in terms of the numbers basically are reflected on, on, on the graph. So the, the share of the uh, corporations basically grew in the, uh, in the expenditure while the opposite happens of course when like to, to the universities. And as the financial, uh, sorry, corporate this is spending on R&D just grew, the academic freedoms basically just, you know, basically uh, took a, a deep dive. Now I, I only did this for four or five minutes, but I think this uh, I need to just find maybe, maybe for, uh, another one to just make my punchline because this is not in the commentary. Actually, it was the, it was supposed to, but for some reason the uh, uh, people who reviewed you know, like my paper asked me to just get this out. Uh, and we can talk about that later. I mean, this is not just about Turkey. It's not just about the United States. Actually, the mo moral of the story is as follows. Turkey, and to some extent, and maybe the Middle East in general, basically should not be taken as uh, an extraordinary case, but uh, rather a reference point for what would happen in the North Atlantic. In other words, you know, let's say I know that you know people who just are original from North Atlantic don't like the idea that the, the Middle East could just you know be a place that just uh, teach them you know about the politics in their own countries given this, you know, like this uh, embedded orientalism, if you will, but I believe that's the case. And, you know, like this, this part of the graph basically, I think helps me to make this part of the point. Um, all the trends we just see in the Turkish context actually are not alien to what has been happening, let's say, in, the, in high income countries. Again, especially after 2009, basically we see a split. Uh, they 
they say uh, reverse, you know, like development, you know, of both, you know, like they say indicators in terms of the value they take. Since 1960, 1996, the higher the R&D expenditure, sort of the, the bigger the, the, the academic credits. Up in 2009, the higher the R&D expenditures, the weaker the, the uh, academic freedom scores. And the last one is just about the United States with, uh, because I presume that you know, some people may just force to stay there at least, you know, they say, uh, who are located you know, in the United States. Sort of you know, like the, the same process. After 2009, basically the freedom of academic and cultural expression scores the deep dive while the R&D, this expenditures basically uh, continue to just grow at an exponential rate, pace. And the last sentence, we know what is going on right now. Uh, we know that, you know, let's say there is a growing pressure in the United States on the academia. And we know that, you know, they say the strongest, you know, like actor that takes part, you know, in this particular crisis in the U.S. academia are the donors. Now, the question I would like uh, to ask uh, is this. I mean, uh, which one just do we prioritize? Do we need to prioritize first academic freedoms and then scientific progress or vice versa? Because uh, I mean that this question is more, uh, more than a just moral question or your personal opinion. Now, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, like if you do not prioritize academic freedoms and then turn, let's say, the higher education institutions into money generating, you know, let's say, uh, machines, then even though they say initially these institutions produce good results in terms of the metrics of scientific progress, they just find themselves in this maze and under this great pressure of those who basically just uh, provide these resources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Balaban. Um, our next two speakers center their contributions on the condition of displacement. Um, on the very particular kinds of challenges to academic uh, freedom that they experience as displaced scholars in North America, and on instrumentalizing displacement as a method of research. So we turn first to Dr. Evren Altinkas, and his paper is entitled Displaced Scholars as a Contribution to Academic Diversity. Dr. Altinkas, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor Lowy. Uh, I, when I wrote this article, uh, I think it was, you know, because of the publication process and the editing and reviewing, it was one and a half years ago. But when <laughs> I look at it, uh, I see nothing has changed. So, <laughs> so it is still uh, relevant. So uh, my topic was about the displaced scholars and their contribution to academic diversity. But instead of summarizing my article, I want to go with a story uh, which will pretty much sum up everything I wrote in my article, if that's fine with you. Uh, in Turkey, uh, I was a, I was I was a I was an unwanted scholar due to my uh, political opinion, due to my uh, criticism of the Turkish government. And because of this, I was unemployed for more than three years. Uh, and in Canada, uh, I am a displaced scholar uh, who is currently a highway professor. Uh, that, that's how I call myself. Uh, traveling among different universities to find suitable courses for me to teach in order to survive. So within context, there is not a big difference. The only difference in that sense is that I can teach, but I was not able to teach back in Turkey because I was condemned. So I can teach, but I, I have to teach anything that is suitable with my research. I teach sociology, I teach political science, I teach history of the Middle East, and now I will be teaching research and writing at a college because uh, that's what I can do. That's the limits that are put uh, around me by the North American uh, academic uh, context. I'm not complaining, but I'm just trying to build up what I am uh, uh, going to emphasize in this uh, in this in this talk. Uh, what I believe 
is that I'm going to have a very critical approach based on what Utku said and what Nihat said. Uh, I believe everything is very good in North America when it comes on writing it on paper. For instance, yes, there is diversity on paper. Yes, there is equity, equality on paper. Yes, there is inclusion on paper. And everything is like a, a, like a, like a Netflix TV series in which you believe you can find everything while watching the trailer. But when you uh, start watching the actual TV series or movie, it is nothing. It is the same pattern, same story, but no, no excitement at all. So I believe uh, instead of talking about the problems of displaced scholars in, in, in North America uh, and their potential inclusion to, uh, to the description of equity, diversity and inclusion, uh, I wanted to end my talk with a uh, with a, with an anecdote from my favorite uh, TV show, one of my favorite TV shows. Uh, Big Bang Theory is a very good TV show that talks about universities. I mean, because those are for uh, PhD students or doctors who are employed at a university. And the main protagonist, uh, Sheldon Cooper, uh, claims that he is the smartest guy among others and he is the you know most intelligent person among uh, his friends so there is a competition uh, based on like a trivia and uh, he says i can beat all three of you by myself however according to the rules you must have at least two other team members in order to participate so he looks around while he's sitting with his friends in the cafeteria and says uh, I'm going to pick the janitor and I'm going to pick the waitress in my team because I can beat you with them as well. So, and the competition begins, the trivia begins, and there is a final question about nuclear physics. Neither of the groups can answer it. Sheldon is stuck. And then suddenly the, the janitor Sheldon put into his team stands up, takes a chalk in his hand and solves the equation in two seconds. And then Sheldon looks at him and says, uh, what's going on? How did you do it? He said, well, I have a PhD from Moscow State University in nuclear physics, but I don't have an equivalency here. Uh, and I don't have my uh, Canadian, American, European experience in academia. And that's why I'm working as a janitor. So I believe uh, based on the fact that uh, equity, diversity and inclusion is only at, on paper and trailers, uh, I think this is one of my last talks I'm going to give as an academics because I am considering focusing on becoming a janitor or someone like that with a permanent position. So I think this summarizes my uh, paper and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Altinkas. Our last speaker um, is Dr. Basileus Zeno, um, whose paper is entitled Decolonizing Displacement Research Betweener autoethnography as a method of resistance. Thank you, Dr. Zeno. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you again for hosting all of us. For, uh, thank you for Global Academy, for Mesa, uh, Miriam, uh, Mimi, and everyone uh, who was uh, very supportive during this uh, difficult journey for us and lonely, uh, very lonely journey in, in exile. Most of us are living in, in actual exile. So let me share my slides first and then we'll take it from here. There we go. Okay. Uh, can you see my slides? Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, this paper uh, that I'm, I'm here like um, complementing um, uh, the uh, uh, the first two papers gave us more background about uh, authoritarian suppression and um, I think all of us are the result of authoritarian suppression and then when we leave we encounter other forms of suppression that I think unfortunately this is why everyone's paper is still relevant we hope one day None of our paper would be relevant, but it seems like not in the near future. So this uh, this paper is co-authored with uh, my partner who has, um, uh, due to medical uh, conditions, she can't uh, present this. Uh, it's a co-authored work. 
in which we reflect on the challenges that we both face in our respective fields, political science and communication. But as everyone and as everyone, like we had pre-displacement academic life and it was pretty successful. Uh, I had 10 years of uh, uh, academic life as an archaeologist. I have my BA, MA, and almost done PhD before the uh, Damascus University dismissed me without notification. Um, and nevertheless, I continued my academic book, which was published earlier this year by the uh, Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies, and which focused on my previous field uh, on um, Hellenistic period in, in Syria, specifically uh, uh, numismatics. But none of that, that should have been my 10 year uh, book. That's the promotion for me, but nothing would be counted here. So 10 years of hard work is is vanished from, from uh, once you are displaced from one setting to another setting. This is why this paper captures some of the challenges that we faced here in the United States and Canada and some of which were incorporated actually in a, a policy paper um, to the left, li Lives in Limbo, How the Boston Asylum Office Fails Asylum Seekers, where we incorporate actually um, uh, ethnography um, following the denial of asylum um, case after almost 10 years uh, due to the Trump policy. So we show the mechanism of racialized politics within the asylum system in the United States. But to the right is the academic paper that we published um, uh, recently. To that end, I conducted over 100 interviews online and offline, semi-structured interviews between 2014 and 2023. Uh, and that includes uh, asylum seekers, uh, temporary protection status holders, TPS, uh, refugees, and immigration attorneys. And I use ethnography as the main method here in, in addition to a qualitative method, which is centered around interviews. Um, and auto, I found auto-ethnography as a liberating um, uh, and necessary tool not to be shy um, uh, from, from using, where our positionality and our embodied experience dealing with legal violence as Syrians or as Turkish or Iranian or Palestinians is part and parcel of the way how we are uh, finding um, safe heaven or the lack thereof in within academic institutions. I also use discourse analysis and how that impact policies addressed towards uh, the framing of uh, specifically uh, not just immigrant and asylum seekers from coming from the Middle East. My contribution center around the experiences of racialized activists after displacement, which illustrate the coloniality of immigration and asylum systems and how the war in terror specifically has become a global system of racialized violence and necropolitics, both in Europe, North America and home country specifically how authoritarian regime has uh, co-opted uh, this rhetoric and uh, on the war on terror to justify suppression and cracking down on critics uh, against authoritarian regimes. Uh, in addition to that, we I hope to contribute to epistemic decolonization of migration studies uh, by using interpretivist methodologies that focus on meaning making processes and uh, the acknowledgement that knowledge is historically situated and intersubjectively co-produced in a power leading context dependent relationship. So I have two key animating questions that direct all my work. Uh, what do we miss analytically, ethically, and empirically when we focus on state-centric approaches to power and politics in a state of lived experience of ordinary people? And the second main question, sub-questions, what are the effect of recentering global politics of race around decolonized knowledge production and intersectional analysis? So we reflect in our paper on some of the challenges that we face in and off the field, some of the challenges, and would be more than happy to discuss during the Q&A, uh, some um, is mistrust. When you interview, if you are Turkish and interviewing Turkish uh, citizen in, in the United States or Canada or Syria, there is a mistrust, mistrust uh, that have been built up by authoritarian socialization. No one would trust you because you might report them to the authorities. Identification and categorization by participants. Sometimes I found that there is an evasion, there is a, a rumors, character assassination, not because something that I said, but because I was framed by participants through my social media to be under one category or another. That's something that I have no control over. Another uh, form that we face is fear of retaliation, even in country of displacement. So people sometimes act as if they believe in 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 the things that they say, even when uh, in different settings they would say something else. So sometimes I, we had multiple interviews with people who would say different things, not because they were lying, but because building trust will take really time. 
We saw also coloniality of knowledge and hierarchical power, and that is divided between local privileged citizenship and white scholars, uh, which creates sense of internalized inferiority. So scholars, even like if you are from the Middle East, but second, third generation, I, we found like they had more access than us coming from the very same conditions of displacement. We, we saw also gatekeeping and who is controlling the narrative. That's amongst activists, but also amongst senior uh, scholars who kept like basically some problematic narrative around the Syrian conflict, because that also gave them access to more scholars at the risk of, of fight. So there was, um, and that comes through grants, come, uh, come through peer review journal, come through many uh, other forms. Stolen time, that's all of us as scholars in displacement that we face. It's the non-accountable for uh, form of time stolen by the government in exile, where we have to do with deal uh, with paperwork to get to struggle to keep our bank account alive, or uh, to to get our driving license, to have the permit to work, and, and fear of retaliation. Secondary traumatic stress, which is coming, and I'm concluding in the next uh, uh, slide. A secondary traumatic stress, which is coming from stories of violence, of rape, of of, of cracking down, of fearing for the life of families and beloved ones who are remained back home. So sometimes we had to sacrifice some research that we completed, but it will endanger our immediate family. Therefore, we had to basically not talking about. Therefore, we are advocating to use um, uh, what Diversity and Morea um, uh, coined as between us autoethnography, which is a mode of, of resistance that historically mar uh, marginalized and displaced scholar can use to destabilize Euro-American norms and transgress the national order of things. Because we simultaneously inhabit both intense precarity as displaced Syrians without protective status, but at the same time we are privileged really in really when we compare our uh, positionality with uh, other to our academic standing as scholars in North America, which gave us some sort of protect uh, protections. We advocate for embracing intersectionality in and displacement research and self flexibility across every single stage of conducting, writing, reflecting and publishing. And finally, ethics not is something to get approval by the ethic boards or the IRB, but it's a process that we have to continue to think about because it can, uh, the research can unintentionally cause harm when it's being published. So between our ethnography can serve as a method of resistance, uh, as I said, but decolonizing academic uh, academia generally and, margin, uh, and migration and displacement research specifically has been a long struggle that cannot be achieved by individual researchers alone and require institutional uh, commitment to achieve these goals. And we are seeing in the United States a reversal of many politics, especially in the southern uh, states where they are basically defunding many equity programs under the disguise of uh, many false accusations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zeno. Thank you very much. And thank you, all of you. Thank you, all of you, for these very rich and thought-provoking contributions. Really a lot to think about. Um, well, let me begin by saying that here we are in North America in the fall of 2023, uh, with all the horrors that we are witnessing. Um, from our own governments, in our universities, on our campuses, and the various pressures exerted upon the academy, upon university governance, but also the freedom of speech and freedom of expression, etc. And for me, um, learning more about the particular history of authoritarianism in Turkey, for example, and especially more recently, the increasing and all encompassing control of the AKP over the academy, not only in so far as university governance is concerned, but also research agendas, uh, with the well nigh criminalization, or at least lack of support for certain topics of research, this is also um, this is also very unsettling. It's really profoundly unsettling. Um, so let me just 
proceed to my comments and questions to each one of you, and I'll keep it brief so that we can have a larger discussion, hear back from you and then from the audience. To um, Professor Celik, um, you provide um, a, a really vivid description of how the AKP gradually increased what um, has become its takeover of the academy. And in your paper, you suggest that more recently, there have been new and more powerful political dynamics of resistance and social mobilization in Turkey to challenge the AKP. So I wonder if you can elaborate a bit on these dynamics and what they're able to achieve. And also, if you could suggest to us what kinds of pressures, if any, does Erdogan respond to? Um, thank you. Uh, there are, of course, social dynamics at work. Turkey has a young population, and uh, there are certain public opinion surveys that is which show that um, the younger generation actually compared to the baby boomers or uh, millennials, for example, have less support for the AKP. And when you look at the uh, education indicator, people with a four-year college degree or more, uh, they their support for the AKP is also, uh, it also declines. So there is this sort of relationship. And youth actually... Uh, it's not only the universities. Today we talked more about the universities due to the topic, but <clears throat> it is the uh, secondary school system as well, which is des designed because of, uh, you know, every education system uh, wants to produce, uh, you know, in the Soviets, it was the uh, homo sovieticus. So the system has something in mind, and that's why they are transforming the system. It's about the curriculum. For example, the evolution theory was uh, removed from the curriculum of uh, high schools and secondary schools um, in Turkey. But it is not limited to the universities or uh, education institutions. For example, in many smaller cities, they still cannot do it in large cities like Istanbul, Izmir, or Ankara. But music festivals organized concerts, for example, a group of people organized around uh, a religious entity. Now, nowadays, they all have their own, own their own nonprofit organizations. They file petitions to the office of the governor, and all of a sudden, the governor cancels the permit for that music uh, event for the festival. So this is sort of social pressure thanks to their organization they can bring not only on the universities but other aspects of social life as well from arts to um, music however there's the resistance and despite uh, winning the elections uh, in subsequent years uh, the uh, support is uh, you know doing link and the younger generation has less support for them so these dynamics are going to change the political tides Okay, thank you. Um, to Professor Balaban, um, I was really struck by your um, interconnecting the move in the 1980s to export-led growth with a focus on light ma manufacturing with the decline in academic freedom and increasing constraints on the university and sort of the intertwined impact insofar as universities University campuses experience the growing influence of private interests and research agendas, or at least those that receive support and recognition, are those that support the economic model, the new economic model of development. And at the same time, the social sciences and humanities, the very disciplines that we consider are, are, are the ones that give rise to new ideas receive uh, little, if any, recognition. So this suggests that in order to succeed in academia, to have a career in which you are recognized for your work, you need to submit to this model. 
And I'm just wondering, I mean, that sounds like it's the death of the social sciences and humanities, right? So do you want to say a bit more about this? Absolutely. So um, uh, thank you, uh, Miriam. Thank you, Professor Lowy, so for, for this question. Actually, just, you know, let me then paraphrase you on like this little section in my commentary. So like, you know, maybe just to give a sense you know, about uh, how I feel about this part of transfer. First of all, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, there's a, a grave danger, I would say, you know, let's say, I mean, I wouldn't say that, you know, social science and humanities, you know, let's say have, uh, have been uh, happy places, if you will. I mean, uh, as, as other contributors pointed out, you know, like, you know, they say where we are, it's, it's always has been a sad struggle anyway. Uh, but the problem is now, right, back, back in the day, this wasn't very much about this, about the government used to, to us, right? So even for us in the United States, where this is the uh, non-government, you know, like higher education institutions have been historically very, very strong. Uh, we just used to call this McCarthyism, right? So like, you know, there was a government, there was Red Scare, et cetera, et cetera. Things are not you know, working like that anymore. They say the lines are completely dependent on they say uh, non-government you know, like funding in the United States and in Turkey. I mean, if you want to really do something, you need to just you know, look for this say, external funding for your own research. Now, is this is the 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 of the model. So, like coming back, you know, like to that little uh, commentary, I just you know, had an exchange with the old friend. You know, like say just after I just came to the states uh, after after an interesting this trip. And then one of my old friends, you know, like they say, just gave me a call without knowing that, you know, I was in the United States. He was uh, in hard sciences, he had a prestigious position in one of the research universities in the United States, and you know, he was from Turkey. But again, the difference was that, you know, he was in the hard sciences. And I mean, I just you know, told him that, you know, I just, you know, uh, felt a bit uneasy with the fact that he had not uh, given me any call when I was in Turkey. And uh, he said that, you know, that was not his business because, you know, what I did was just, you know, about politics. So he just felt like he was exempt from politics. Now, I think you know, the way I see it, you know, this is, this is a part of the struggle as well. So like this is a point that I just wanted to make you know, in that commentary. It's not only about the people in social sciences and humanities against the government. This is not even a, just a struggle of those in social science and humanities against um, say corporations, foundations, politically motivated foundations. This is also a struggle against, you know, they say those who believe that, you know, they just can do quote unquote science without just you know, touching uh, anything, you know, they say related to politics. I mean, if you don't wanna just, you know, uh, if you wanna stay away from it, and you can do that for some time, but later, you know, it's going to find you in one way or another. I mean, and you know, like something that you wouldn't expect, and a kind of question that you wouldn't just, you know, expect you to answer, you to, to talk about. Uh, that is complex. And let me just say one last thing. Uh, years ago, I just met another, um, I had a very long conversation with another very dear archaeologist friend. And you know, just you know, she, uh, and she just you know told me about this part of the method which the archaeologists use. If you just you know are on a, a potential excavation site, and if you know that almost if you are almost sure that you know that there is some sort of a relic uh, under the ground, but if you uh, believe that after the excavation process, your find could be in one way or another. Uh, harm uh, by uh, the people in that region, by the government, etc. Then you choose to let that particular object stay under the ground. I mean, the pace of the scientific progress, I mean, we want it to be as high as possible, but academic freedom is more important than the pace of the scientific progress. You should never ever just you know, forget about this particular this principle because if you lose the, this academic freedom, then that scientific progress, which seems to could be just could seem very high at the moment, would just you know I mean wouldn't just do any good you know, like to the people in the first place. And again, this is I think the kind of crisis we 
experience in Turkey up to 2015, especially with the Kurdish issue. Now we have a similar global issue. Again, I'm not going to say what it is, but I, I assume everyone knows what it is. Actually, I'm seeing the same nightmare, almost exactly the same nightmare. And the scholars, you know, have to speak up, not only about the particular issue, but about the very restructuring of the higher education, both in the United States and elsewhere. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, to Professor Altinkas, you're absolutely right. I agree with you. Um, um, I, uh, I agree with what you're, um, how you described the sort of um, the, the equity, inclusion, and diversity, and what it really means uh, here. Um, um, it, it's true that these are sound bites. They're they're um, they're buzzwords, um, and um, and so much of this is about being politically correct, and it doesn't um, doesn't go much further than this, I'm afraid. And you've you've uh, you've discovered this, unfortunately, but it is the reality. Um, and and you make it very clear um, that the inclusion through the hiring of displaced scholars can actually provide the real diversity um, that's, that's not simply demographic, but also cultural and experiential and ideological, et cetera, that the academy claims to seek. But as I said, um, what it claims to seek and what it truly seeks are, are not necessarily the same thing. So I'm sorry about this. Um, and I'm, I'm, I fear that the situation will get worse. But, you know, there are a few efforts to be more inclusive. And, um, you know, there's the Global Academy. That's one initiative. There is um, a move to showcase what's being referred to as an Arab social science, okay? Um, and I'm thinking of Setane Shami's operation that's focused, that is even called an Arab social science. So there's an effort to promote, um, and don't worry, I know that Turks aren't Arab, so I, you know, I'm, I'm not making an error here, but I'm just saying that there are these efforts to, you know, um, to to um, get rid of this sort of domination of scholarship um, from North America and Europe, that we know how to do scholarship and no one else does. Okay, so there, there are efforts uh, away from that. Um, there's even um, Cambridge University Press has a, has a new book series and one of the um, one of the targets of this book series is to include scholars from the Middle East and North Africa, um, include have them publish within this series. The people who aren't getting published, uh, if they're able to uh, write or have their work translated into English, then then um, this series will is more accessible. So. It's a tr it's an effort to try to be more uh, inclusive. So I don't really have a question for you, but I just wanted to make those comments. Thank you. Can I add something in what you say? Sure, sure, sure. So you know the diversity part uh, is is very important because I teach very sensitive topics in Canada. I teach history of the Middle East. I teach politics of the Middle East, and I have a very interesting group of students in my classes, students from different parts of the Middle East. It's not limited only with the Arab countries, but students who also have roots in in Israel, in other in Iran, etc., in in Syria, in Turkey, etc. And you know, we we focus on 
the recent conflicts, you know, Arab-Israeli conflict, or I can mention it, it's not a problem, uh, for, for two weeks, three weeks, we did it last semester. My students who were so hesitant to talk about it, who were so, how can I say it in the best way, who were so um, polarized, I mean, because they knew each other, they were sitting at the other sides of the classroom, they were not even looking at each other because they had previous discussions in other courses probably. When I started to tell them about my own experiences with authoritarianism, with, with academic freedom, etc. And then I started to tell them, this is a free environment, go ahead, shoot, no one is going to judge you for what you said. We are here to discuss, we are here to learn, and we are here to understand each other. I had the best discussions I have ever had in my 25 years of academic career. That was amazing. The students, after the end of the class, wanted to continue the conversation. We went to a study room you know, an empty one. We continued for three more hours. They were, they learned from each other. They learned from me. And that was the best experience, according to them, that they ever had in their university life. And they are fourth year students who are going to graduate next semester. So just an example, because what we share with them when it comes to individual stories is like a trigger. It's like unlocking the key for the students to learn and to understand more and to express themselves in a better environment. I'm just mentioning this as an example and I'm pretty much sure all my colleagues here have had similar experiences in that sense. So I think this is what really makes this place scholars an important contribution uh, to diversity. Thank you very much. Um, okay. May I make a, a small contribution? Um, sure. Actually, the main problem is that uh, most of these displaced scholars are in a catch-22 uh, situation, especially those who don't have uh, degrees from North American uh, higher education institutions. So they are actually working as adjuncts with high teaching laws and trying to survive, but at the same time, uh, because of the situation, uh, they have to, in order to get jobs, they have to publish more, but they actually lack that sort of uh, environment uh, or the the uh, state of mind that will allow them to comfortably focus on their research. So this is, uh, in my opinion, one of the challenges that displaced scholars, wherever they are from, uh, they are dealing uh, with. And um, in my uh, career, as I have been uh, teaching as uh, courses on public personnel administration about the federal government and state governments and all the regulations and laws. I also teach diversity, inclusion and equity uh, issues and legislation on that area. Uh, every time I teach that subject, I tell my students that despite the presence of laws and regulations and uh, DEI uh, visions of uh, institutions, be it private or public, you will always uh, face discrimination because discrimination is very difficult to prove at a court of law, even if you uh, start a lawsuit about it. So uh, this is another aspect that these scholars, the space scholars are facing. And it's, actually it is, from my own experience, I can say that it is said to see the decline of merit principle in the academia because you apply to jobs at a community college, uh, for example, and uh, you have PhD publications and years of experience and at the end, someone with a master's degree, uh, just a fresh graduate and no publications, nothing, they get the uh, job. So these are the other problems that uh, displaced scholars are facing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and now to Professor Zeno. Um, you know, I, I was very intrigued by um, your paper, and um, I would love to hear more from you about how one actually conducts autoethnography, how one actually uses ethics as method if you could describe such a research project, um, I would really like that. But also I want to 
point out to you that at some place in your essay, you refer to autoethnography as a method of resistance. Well, um, I would encourage you to not think of your research method only as one to uh, destabilize, transgress, but also to produce knowledge and to contribute. I'm sure you're doing that. So I wouldn't shortchange that in, in your description of your, your your research and 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 the purpose. So please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate this uh, uh, challenging question. So there are uh, once you deal with the ethics as as method and also the the uh, the uh, um, the process of uh, writing ethnography. Of course, ethnography per se uh, has a very problematic colonial history and has been served alongside geography as method for colonial uh, uh, power actually to dominate uh, indigenous communication. But then there was a cultural turn and uh, where uh, 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 scholars critically engaged with uh, autoethnography as a way to criticize uh, ethnography from within. Uh, especially if the author is implicated in this uh, process of power relation. And with the increasing number of uh, scholars who are uh, from the global south mostly and capable of producing knowledge, so coming back to the, they aren't the, you know, the, the object of study, but they are the subject carrying the, 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 their own study, then they face a really, um, uh, first of all, uh, the literature review. For instance, like uh, resources like IDEL, for instance, uh, one paper that was rejected, but it was accepted later from another journal, um, and that's like a concrete example. One of the why one of the uh, um, uh, reviewer number two, of course, always reviewer number two, <laughs> wasn't happy because I use the memoir of politicians in the Syrian National Council who wrote their memoir in Arabic, reflect on some of the. Uh, information that affirm my my theorization and my argument based on interviews that I conducted. So because it's not academic pop, uh, book that was published in English, then that's uh, that means I'm biased against that institution in particular. That was the language that was used to to reject my my paper. So uh, that's the kind of gatekeeping that you face after one year of waiting. And as all of us, we have tight schedule. We are teaching mostly like a, a large load. And then you deal with this process and then you you have to start again, like which basically um, drive the process three years, which was supposed to be one year and a half, now it's three years. So uh, in ethics as methods, it seems to me from dealing with the IRB in the United States for seven, six years and plus, the very same uh, process changed over time. Last time I renewed my IRB, I was asked under Trump, uh, like I was at UMass Amherst. Uh, uh, my partner and I, and I are, are Syrian. So we had to commit that our research, because Syria is under sanction, so our research is not going to benefit Syria or Syrian in any way. So therefore, we had to change actually the field side uh, from, from working um, uh, abroad to focus in the United States within the jurisprudence of the United States. So that's even like shape our research. I had to change my perspectives because I was banned from traveling. I got a grant to uh, uh, conduct a comparative study between the experience of asylum seekers and refugees in Germany and the United States to federal democracy, et cetera. And I, I, was, I was told like, if I left the country, I'm not going to be let in again. That was during the travel ban. Consequently, I had to write a different uh, 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 dissertation that after spending over a year. So election changed my 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 perspective. A white American didn't face this thing because if you check the data of a production of uh, uh, of knowledge around asylum and immigration, you would see as if nothing happened. You have proliferation of books, excellent books. I'm not judging that. But there is this a question like, why I, uh, uh, Nihat, Evren, Otku, can be always uh, like useful when we are, you know, uh, informants, when we are the subject of the study, uh, object of the study. But when we are uh, trying to or attempting to to carry the same knowledge, they, they, applying the same rigorous research, we are really uh, have to struggle and battle and justify ourselves. 
where, where there are consequences of deportation. That's a consequence that, uh, you know, a white American or even like second generation or someone with a green card wouldn't face. So which means like some of the uh, research that we all chose wasn't based on actually the value of the research per se, but because we have been forced to deal with these specific limited spots that we can carry. In addition to that, um, we face also challenges in terms of securing funds. Mostly funds to conduct uh, research within the United States is really in terms of grant is, is small, like 5,000, 10,000. But when you are going abroad, you can secure more money. I spent the same money. So it, uh, uh, I had a portion of the grant that I was awarded to conduct a field work in California. It lasted two weeks. What was supposed to last me like three months in Berlin lasted me only two weeks because I didn't have, I had like, uh, and vanished. Then I had to cut my, my trip short. Uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, autoethnography can serve and should serve uh, as a method of um, engaging critically with the literature, not shying away with, with the, by embracing actually how we in the method section engage with some of the challenges that force us to make certain case selection that doesn't exist in the textbook. I did my comprehensive exam in most in method and other field. Not a single textbook taught me to check my passport first before going to the field work. They assume all of us can learn this method, jump into a flight and then travel. Honestly, the only equalizer was in our life was COVID. Because for the first time ever, scholars who were planning to go into flight were blocked like us and then we felt equal. So I don't know, like it was a curse, but it was a place at the same time to force a scholar to consider, oh, I can't see my family. Oh, I can't travel. Oh, now what, what I'm gonna do with the fund, etc. So I think that's a, sometimes it's a, a momentum to reflect on the existence of not just humanity, but also as a scholars who are, have to struggle with that. And that should be, ethics is not just a document that you carry from IRB, but it's a, some, something to consider throughout the process, thinking, a, a publishing, after publication, what might be the consequences of the publication of your research? And it's a, a long, painful uh, process and full of mistakes. I did mistakes in the past. Uh, I don't have time to reflect on them, but definitely I developed my method through learning from my own mistakes. And thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um... Uh, I see that uh, Utku would like to uh, say something, and then I see a member of our audience, Ma Mansoor Al -Mas Maswari. So Utku, please go ahead, and then we'll turn to Mansoor. Yeah, very, very short. I just want to second, you know, what what uh, has just said. It just pains me that you know I was cut, you know, they say from all this my connections, you know, not all of them, but many of those connections were in my resource setting, which happens to be to, to Turkey. So uh, I wouldn't call myself an ethnographer. I just wouldn't dare call that. But yeah, I did ethnographic research, to be honest with you. And so that was in my commentary that there isn't in much like, you know, trace of it because of the practical disconnection. And um, I don't have anything to just you know suggest, but like, at the end of the day, so like that's another price, invisible price we have to pay. And it's really, very, very, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's devastating. You know, let's say you just spent your years or sometimes decades you know, on a particular let's say, resource setting, and this is poof, it's just gone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Now to Mansur Al Maswari. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And as the, the discussion is about academic freedom in the Middle East, I seize this opportunity to reflect upon academic freedom in Yemen as I'm coming from a Middle East country from Yemen. And uh, discussion is going on about the, the academic threats in the Middle East due to certain, certain reasons, including civil wars, violations, sectarian conflicts. These are understood and we leave our own countries because of the uh, academic security, personal security, uh, academic violation, and all these things. But unfortunately, what we see nowadays in the Western universities amidst the ongoing incidents in Gaza, we find that Western universities, academicians are more oppressed and more assaulted than ourselves because they have no civil wars, they have no threats coming from outside, but still they are threatened to speak so freely 
And uh, speaking pers uh, about the personal experience, I would like to share. Uh, uh, around 20 days, 20 days back, there was a conference uh, organized by the scholars at risk in uh, Carleton University. And uh, uh, I was one of the participants in that conference. Uh, I, I, I was given an opportunity to speak about the academic freedom during wartime in Yemen. Uh, I could not obtain visa to attend the conference because of my nationality. Ethics and closure and all these things are theoretical things. When it comes to application, rights are given not based on merit, but on best, uh, uh, sorry, based on nationality, race, and ethnicity. They, there is still a kind of segregation, whether are you from a certain race, certain nationality, certain uh, religion, this is a challenge we face it not in our countries. We face it in our own displacement. If we want to secure ourselves, we are silenced. We cannot speak freely as thinkers or as free thinkers. If you want to secure yourself physically, you can get it, but you find yourself academically insecure. This is one of the challenges we have experienced during the last couple of years. So honestly. Thanks. I know that. I know that. I um, I would like to open up the floor to. Um, it's terrible. These are terrible times, Mansoor. Um, terrible times. I don't think we've ever experienced this. Not in my lifetime. Um, any other questions or comments from our audience? Anybody at all would like to. Um, Share any thoughts or questions? How about anybody on the panel? Does anyone want to say anything more? Excuse me. Yes, please, Homera. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you so much. The panel was very useful for me. I'm not very involved with uh, Turkey and others country in Middle East. Uh, um, I'm not very involved in the politics. I am a writer, but I wanted to say thank you so much for this panel. I use it a lot. And also I'm very sorry for all those limitations that our friends told us as a scholar at this, I experience. And I say again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Homera. Anybody else? I I had a uh, I have a quick question and then it looks like Ilana um, has one as well. But I wondered Ooh. if any of the panelists um, would have thoughts on how in this moment in North America, given your own experiences and expertise on all these limitations and 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 uh, everything that you have dealt with, and as we are dealing more and more with it in this context in the United States and and Canada too. Do you have any thoughts on how we can support each other better or work together more, collaborate and resist together? Um, maybe that's just food for thought in general, but I would love to hear any thoughts if you if you have them. Thanks. And I guess I mean by displaced scholars in North America with North America scholar, you know, sc scholars who are from North America originally. Yeah. Well, I, I believe you can, uh, I mean, one thing that can be done because there are a lot of people who are neutral or let's say who have no idea about what's going on uh, in terms of, you know, the American, North American university setting and academic freedoms. There are a lot of academics, but they don't know anything about academic freedom or the threats to it. I, 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 I witness it every single day. I'm very, very, very blunt about this. So that's why I suggest uh, to involve more displaced scholars in this discussion uh, in order to let them see what will happen to them if they remain as the silent herd uh, that literally says nothing because at the end they will be suffering from this as well. So I believe that, we, I mean, displaced scholars can be used as 
you know, as, as people who can stand up and speak about this, because we already did it back in our home countries, it's not a problem to do it here. So use us, put us in front. I will have, I will happen to do that. I'm doing it at the universities where I'm teaching. Recently, next semester, I will be doing giving at least five speeches about this. But use us and let these silent people, silent herd, the academic colleagues, see what will happen to them if they do not stand up. So I think this is just a suggestion, of course. Utku, did you have something? Yeah. I think in this country, uh, respect for the scholars is kind of, um, I mean, people conflate meritocracy. All right, so like, you know, let's say with the kind of, let's say, um, let's say, uh, confusion about, you know, what kind of uh, political and moral role the scholars, you know, have to play in a country context. So, uh, in other words, and let's say, I mean, basically my overall experience in this country is that many scholars in this country, many academic staff, let me use that kind of expression, do not have as much pride as they are supposed to in what they are doing. Um, so there is supposed to be a new culture. Basically, scholars, you know, like you know, should uh, many many of them do this, and not all of them. Many of them see what they are doing just yeah. as a job. This is not a job. I mean, uh, this is status. So, like, you know, of course, you know, this it comes you know, with some sort of remuneration because we have to just live. That's true. But they say that's not you know, the, for many of us, it's not the starting point. You know, we are curious, we just want to do something, I mean, like make a contribution to our field, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's that kind of a problem. I think there is something wrong with the culture about the way, let's say, the scholars see themselves in this country. So that's why they, uh, they avoid basically taking part in, let's say, the political decisions you know, about uh, on their campuses which uh, historically basically emboldened and empowered semi-professional administration, administrators on university campuses, many of whom don't think anything about the future of their institution, but their own personal careers. Many of them do not spend too much time at one particular campus, move from one campus to another, et cetera. In, in the meantime, just make decisions about the campuses which they run according to the financial considerations rather than the scholar ones. I mean, so like there is a problem about this, the way the scholars see themselves, which is again, a very confused form of meritocracy. It's not meritocracy. I mean, the scholars should deserve a, a very high level of respect. We are not just you know, anyone. Why? Because we need to be privileged. We need to be privileged so that you know, in the times of crisis, we can speak up. I mean, if we are not, we are not given any kind of privileges. If we just need to just teach like a junk, you know, these instructors, if we get fired whenever there's some, some sort of you know, a geopolitical crisis, et cetera, et cetera, then we basically cannot serve our function. And there is a second problem about the administration side, funding, et cetera. And regarding this problem, I think collectively speaking, everyone in this country and all around the world should start to think about alternative financing let's say, uh, paradigms about how to really, let's say, source, you know, like the budgets of individual institutions so that the universities can maybe slow down, maybe not give high raises to administrators, you know, primarily, not to get too much funding, and then to make sure that no one just works as adjunct instructors. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wants to say something? Uh, Ilana and then Naim and then me. Okay, I don't see those uh, names coming in. Ilana? Yeah, actually, I was um, going to ask uh, a very similar question uh, to to Mimi and, and maybe, you know, since once I've raised my hand, I want to say something. I'll I'll just um, can sort of continue these reflections that people have already started on this topic. I mean, I was very struck in reading these essays prior to our current moment um, by how many lessons they um, held for us in terms of thinking. Uh, and, and for us, I mean, for all of us, right? Not, you know, both um, 
you know, North American identified, North American located academics and, you know, academics in other places and academics from other places located in North America were all um, participating um, in a in a global dynamic, though do so differently with different kinds of vulnerabilities. Um, but many of the issues that that you all raise in these essays um, are um, you know, relevant. I mean, it has already come up to to many people in the in the North American Academy. So things like you know the the vulnerability of un of unstable contracts, right? Whether as adjunct or as kind of one year positions the um, vulnerability of, you know, donor dependence in its various kinds, whether that is in a an external granting agency or the kind of individual donors, I mean, you know, which only some of the wealthiest universities have, but then we see the, the, the dramatic negative effects of um, billionaire um, investments in, in the academy. I think another thing, which maybe was Slightly less emphasized in, in your essay, though I think comes up as well, but that really has been um, part of the the a condition of the of the academy in the U.S. that has actually made us as a collective, that is the professoriate vulnerable, is the emphasis on sort of individual careers, individual achievement, um, which makes it very hard for um, in many places professors in the United States just to really operate as part of a collective and a community and therefore to um to organize for self-defense um in the face of attacks and then of course we're dealing um i mean we've been dealing for in a long time in the in the united states with attacks on academic freedom um put in the guise of domestic considerations right so florida is the kind of most extreme example of it but we see it all over with attacks on D on um you know critical race theory or diversity in other forms or the idea of, you know, sort of wokeness, all of these things, right? So this has been a longstanding um, pressure. And then has, as has already been mentioned by many people today, we are dealing with at the very current moment, the most aggressive assault on academic freedom that I think we have seen since the McCarthy era. Um, and I think all of the other vulnerabilities, adjunctification, donor dependence, um, individualization have left us very poorly equipped um, to really confront the crisis that we're dealing with now. So these things are not separate, right? We have been undercut, I think, in our in our ability to stand up. So this is now kind of a long comment rather than a question, because my question really was also Mimi's, which is like, what what can we do together? And 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 how do we think from the various um because each of you uh, comes at this problem in a connected but slightly different way. So there are so many resources and you only represent part of the resources that, that we all have. Um, so, I mean, I think um, perhaps Basilius was going to continue with this conversation. So I guess I'll just say my the, the question that Mimi asked to me remains on the table for us all uh, to continue to think with. And it's going to be how we, and I don't just mean we in this, in this Zoom room right now, but how we as um, academics here and around the world respond to this moment is going to um, shape, and I don't, this may sound dramatic, but I think our circumstances are dramatic, the capacity of the university to exist in the future in any form that, re that re relates to what we have valued in it. Yeah. Any more? Yeah. Thank you, Mimi, for raising such important questions. I'm I wanted to mention if I'm I'm not sure about the possibility of this suggestion, but this is my suggestion regarding your um you know a question. Uh, I you know since I work on inclusive university, I suppose that it would it would be it would be I mean um very useful if um you know universities who are who committed to the you know uh, scholars at risk or a threatened scholars network can provide some lines for displaced scholars because when we apply for a advertised position lots of scholars at the same time apply for that while we are not on the same you know page or in the same position 
I'm wondering if, um, you know, MISA or other organization can negotiate with um, different, I mean, universities who are committed to network for threatened scholars and open a line, specific line for um, hiring scholars at risk or displaced scholars. So it could be a, a competition between the scholars at the same position, not um, a big competition. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, thanks for that, Naima. Because yeah, so often I I know we all have um, talked with each other about this. It, those the lines that are open are one or two years, right? That are put in place. But you're talking about something like a tenure track position that would be for it for dis the the pool of applicants would be displaced scholars. Yeah. 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 I'm talking about tenure track, right? Yeah. So this yeah. is the you know suggestion I raised with the mm -hmm. dean and ask him because they encouraged me to apply for a position in uh, at the University of Pittsburgh and I suggest and then they uh, they told me yeah for this position we received around a hundred um, applications so your application has no chance for this position so I just wanted to negotiate with um, the dean and see if they can uh, support, you know, scholars at risk or displaced scholars because they are, they are not, yeah, it's very possible that they are not competitive enough with, you know, regular, uh, I mean, um, scholars. So I'm wondering if it could be uh, raised as a, um, you know, institutional, I mean, demands or institutional request. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a I think it's a great suggestion. It's something I'll talk to the committee about and maybe it's something we can fundraise for. It that seems to me like that would be the 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 crux of it, right? We if we get universities to do that, we would have to match funds or something like that. So um but yeah, thank you. And but I can, Mesa, yeah. But Mesa as an institution would not be able to play that role. No, right? Mesa could not do that. No. It, it would have to be no. Does it? it? It would. That's yeah. Exactly. Mesa does not. Uh, you know, Mesa re represents scholars of the Middle East and North Africa. It cannot negotiate for jobs for them. So, but it it represents them in in so far as it's sort of a an intellectual and academic home for them. But not. It cannot. You know, negotiate individual jobs for for scholars. Um, but um, there may there may be other avenues for that, for that kind of thing. So, yeah, um, it would be something that the Global Academy could perhaps try to do as something a bit separate, but it, we would have to have a university interested in doing it, right? You would have to partner with different universities, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Just one sentence before Vasilios, sorry Vasilios, just one sentence to add into this. I think eventually everybody in the North American universities, not only us, will become displaced scholars. So th I believe I believe uh, it will be the natural cause to add displaced scholars as academic diversity because there will be no one else left. This is what I foresee, just to add into that, sorry. Other questions? Is there anybody? I'm not uh, I mean, to add to what Evren said, uh, to confirm the <laughs> the grim reality is that uh, there was an audit to several universities here in Ontario, uh, which has more universities in Canada than other Can uh, Canadian regions. Uh, so there is substantive deficit coming from hiring uh, uh, administrators. So basically they say there is no line for uh, faculty, then they hire adjunct and they froze the, uh, you know, the, um, the the tuition fee. The tuition fee in comparison with the US is nothing. I know coming from two contexts, but still a lot for many students, right? So they froze this um, uh, tuition. So there is no income coming to the university. And they said like, we don't have line for uh, 10 year track faculty, despite the increasing number of enrollment. So there isn't decrease, there is an increased number of uh, enrollment. So what's the solution is basically to uh, hire adjunct and contractual limited appointments where scholar would teach at least 
six courses per year and expected to produce research, of course, expected to excel in, in soliciting, you know, external fund, etc. Uh, do everything but like Octopus, like you have to have all these hands at the same time. But when you check the budget and you see like, if the vice president is getting 200 or 300,000 a year per, per year, that's three lines. And when you have like vice five, six uh, vice presidents, I don't know what the problem is. And when the university is collapsing, and that's partly about, uh, not partly, mainly is the new liberal economy that is functioning and operating within universities where contracts are being given to bankers and friends and, and, and colleagues to benefit them. But that's something else. But that's what's producing these conditions of precarity, even amongst uh, you know, non-displaced scholar. This is why Evren, what he said, like I'm, I'm seeing that. I'm seeing increasing number of very qualified uh, scholars who can't find a job and they are going to uh, to uh, seek the work with the industry, including some of my my friends and colleagues like who were in my program. They were brilliant, but they after one two years and they 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 gave up because adjunct is not a, a, a salary that you can live uh, for or buy and or uh, let alone support your family. Um, so uh, I think uh, to answer to go back to the and conclude with the uh, first question. I think Ilana, like I mentioned, really uh, excellent point about the donor dependent. So how sustainable global academy can, can become? Is it for two years, five years, six years? We don't know. It's dependent on the donors. And maybe the, if the presidency and the board change, we see in university that they are cutting off program for uh, 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 supporting diversity and equity uh, hiring like they are freezing and said like it's about merits now and we see the supreme court also reverse uh, uh, decisions uh, based on it so the threat that we see started in florida is expanding and actually is swallowing and becoming the model where everyone is mimicking that uh, yeah and so i think uh, the best thing that have been done for us to acknowledge the uh, we connected with each other we knew that we aren't alone in, 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 in this. So when what we were shying away and really feel um, intimidated and humiliated by talking about, we, by reflecting, regardless of our coming from Syria or from Palestine or Yemen, Libya, Turkey, Iran, we shared the same experience in shaped by the same conditions. Uh, uh, so not being alone encouraged us actually to publish in the in that round table and i i can't underestimate how important and significant uh, that opportunity was not just because it's the igmes but because actually uh, you were so patient with us all of us are dealing with a really a big load of of teaching so usually editors would be i'm done you have two months if you pass that i'm, I'm moving forward you were extremely patient with every single one of us, not because we were lazy, but because we really we were handling life, uh, family, and the teaching, and at the, at the same time trying to write a couple of sentences before going to sleep. So this kind of um, you know invisible labor from your part, like uh, Elana, you, and, uh, and 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 Miriam volunteering to discuss our paper, is extremely important. Um, uh, like. Uh, uh, not just symbolically, but also empirically, because that is an indicator that we have a line on CV, that we publish something, that we are trying to say something, and it was reviewed, it was discussed, is what it was criticized. And so I think um, that should be always, like if you can each year for each group of a global academy scholar, if you can dedicate like round table each year to become like the norm, not the exception, that would be extremely helpful for, for, and we can discuss the themes. We can like have a meeting and then let's focus on one, two, three or so, something like that. Is it the topic of authoritarianism inside and outside? Is it repression? Is it, uh, uh, so, and then uh, next generation will benefit from that or some of us will contribute again like to, to that, but make this sustainable, permanent, I, I wish like we can open a line like with the universities. Uh, we know how it works. Anyone who works with the university and uh, we can advise, but we cannot push and say like, hey, uh, what's up, Dean? Like, let's let's create a line. We know you have like deficit. We have increased. In, or we can't control that. But at least something that we can control is actually uh, keep this uh, ball uh, uh, rolling and also keep this academic journal open for uh, displaced scholar uh, until there is no displacement in the world. Thank you. Mimi, uh, can I 
just one second. I mean, I, 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 I definitely support Basilius' idea. If in case Mesa Global Academy wanna continue with working the new generations or new cohorts, not in the cohorts and like scholars, to just you know motivate them publishing, I myself would like to take. I mean, any kind of your know, job, you know, let's say would like to give me, you know, let's just help this project, the process, reading the papers, etc. Uh, just, I just want to let you know, because I mean, we just already just got our fair share you know, from all the support and the help. So like, I think it's time you like to pay back. So mm -hmm. thanks. No kind. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks, Utku. Thank you all. So I think um, if there are no more questions or comments, I think we'll, say goodbye until next time. This was really a very wonderful meeting and I hope I meet you all again. Um, I myself am happy to assist with reading papers, and editing, whatever I can do. Um, so any of you can reach out to me um, at any time and I'm available to help as well as best I can. And um, I hope we meet again and thank you so much for enriching our understanding about so much of this and um and um thank you and thank you Mimi for putting this together very 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 good thank you. Thank, thank you thank you so you. much everyone thank, thank you so much. thank you everyone thank you. Thank I'll you put it next time in person <laughs> next time in person yes thank all you. the best thanks thank, thank you Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.